we are going to continue this series that um, we began a few weeks ago, talking about the upside down kingdom. What I want to do this morning is uh, want to start with uh, this story, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Has anybody ever heard of, of this book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Great book, great book. And in the book, we meet a character. The character's name is Edmund, Edmund Penvisey. He is one of four uh, Penvisey, or Penvisey, I'm sorry, Penvisey children. Peter, who's the oldest, Susan, who's the next oldest, Edmund, and Lucy. Basically, Edmund's a middle child, but we'll get to that in another, in another story. Lucy is the youngest. And they are drawn into the land of Narnia through the wardrobe, or what some of us here in the Midwest might call the chiffon robe. Anybody ever you know what a chiffon robe is? Okay, you guys know what that is, right? And it's found in the corner of a rather empty room of a house that they're sent to live in uh, during, uh, in, in the countryside of England during the days of World War II uh, Britain. And it's a fantastic story. And, and if you haven't read it, I would highly recommend uh, that you read the entire Chronicles, not just The Lion, the Witch, and Wardrobes, because I know that's a tendency, right? You read the entire Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis. Well, early on in this story uh, of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, we're introduced to several key characters to in addition to the children. And in the early pages of the story, we meet Jadis. Does anybody know who Jadis is? If you've read the story, Jadis is also known as the White Witch, right? And she exploits Edmund's weakness when she meets him in a snowy wood, offering him a warm drink and Turkish delight, his favorite candy. From the first bite, he's hooked. Uh, for each piece was sweet and light to the very center, and Edmund had never tasted anything more delicious. And as she plies him for information regarding his brothers and sisters, he readily replies, driven by this insatiable hunger for more and more Turkish delight. At first, Edmund tried to remember that it's rude to speak with one's mouth full, but soon he forgot about this and thought only of trying to shovel down as much Turkish delight as he could. And the more he ate, the more he wanted to eat. And he never asked himself why the queen would be so inquisitive. After getting the information she wanted for her ultimately nefarious plans, we read this. At last, the Turkish delight was all finished. And Edmund was looking very hard at the empty box and wishing that she would ask him whatever he wants. She would ask him whatever she wanted uh, and if he would like some more. Probably the queen knew quite well what he was thinking, for she knew, though Edmund did not, that this was enchanted Turkish delight. And anyone who tasted it would want more and more of it and would, even if they were allowed, go on eating it until they killed themselves. That's something we find Jesus dealing with in this part of the Sermon of the Mount, this upside down kingdom here in Matthew chapter five. Jesus is explaining to everyone who is listening that the way they have been told to live will never be satisfactory. It will never be enough. There will always be a desire for more and there'll be more and more required of them, expected of them. However, Jesus is about to explain that the path to authentic happiness, fulfillment, and community. It's threatened by three unique markers. And his way to overcoming them will change everything. Here's what I want you to walk away with from this sermon today with this. Jesus' call to upside down kingdom living in Matthew chapter five, verses 21 through 32, requires confronting false narratives. These false narratives will demand that we engage in deep inward examination so that we can begin to deconstruct the lies and withstand the triple threat to our opportunity to live freely and fully as citizens of the kingdom of God. Um, you've heard this phrase before, right? Have you, how many of you have ever heard this phrase, triple threat? Have you ever heard somebody talked about as being a triple threat? Yeah. 
Uh, and that's typically, though, someone who can, uh, is typically a performer, actually. I, I thought it was an athlete. It actually refers to a performer who can act, sing, and what do you think the next one is? Dance. Very good, yeah. Triple threat performers are multi-talented, well-rounded performers, and it's a good thing. But this morning, I want us to examine a different triple threat that Jesus warns us to be mindful of with regard to kind of these inward impulses and external disruptions as it relates to our hearts, our motives, our heads, our minds, our hands, our actions. So here's what we're going to begin with. We're going to begin by examining this first triple threat. And here's the first deadly threat, murder. Murder. Read along with me from Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. You have heard it said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and uh, be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who's taking you to court. Do it while you are still uh, together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown in prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Here, Jesus is focusing on internal motives and motivation. He's talking about what's happening in our hearts. What's going on in our heart? Jesus, in verses 21 through 43, here in chapter 5, he's talking and relating directly to six Old Testament law passages. And it's really interesting that in this key teaching on how kingdom citizens are supposed to live from the inside out, Jesus starts with these six passages. Passages that focus not on performing uh, the right or best ways to acknowledge the God of the universe, but rather, just like the last six commandments of the 10 commandments, these focus on living and dealing with other people, how we live in community, how we relate to one another. And that's what Jesus does here. Six passages that deal with our attitudes, our actions, our heart's condition as we deal with other people. And again, the language here indicates that Jesus is making sure that his listeners know that he's calling people to go well beyond anything that the teachers of the law might expect or demand of them to live according to the law. It's a heart change. Not just going through the motions so you can say, well, at least... Well, at least, well, at least I did that. Here's the deal. Here's why Jesus says what he says and points to the heart when he singles out the language we may use or when we're involved in a dispute or disagreement with someone else. This is why Jesus does it. Jesus knows, Jesus knows that if a person is angry enough with someone else, we would harm someone, especially if we thought we could get away with it. He knows that. He knows that if we thought we could do it, we'd do it. You don't believe me? You don't believe me? Cedar Glen, California. A man shot and killed a 66-year-old business owner in front of her California clothing shop after he made disparaging remarks about an LGBTQ plus pride flag that stood outside of her store. That's what I read in one news outlet. Here's another one. Travis Ekaguchi was responsible for shooting Laura Ann Carlton to death after yelling many homophobic slurs about the store's pride flag on Friday. Here's the last story that I came across. Again, Travis Ekaguchi fired at officers when they confronted him about a mile from the scene later on Friday. Deputies returned fire and struck Ikaguchi, who died at the scene. 
There's a, a, a Bible teacher, um, writer, author. His name is Craig Keener. And he says this, Jesus presses beyond behavior specifically punished by law to the kind of heart that generates such behavior. Now, let's be clear. Let's be clear, okay? Anger in itself is not sinful. Anger is not sinful. That's not what Jesus says here in this passage, nor is that really supported by any other scripture. As a matter of fact, uh, Paul uh, writes this. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Friends, it's not the anger that's the threat. That's the problem. It's what we do with the anger. Does that make sense? It's not the anger. It's what we do with it. That's the problem. Maybe we're not committing murder with our hands, but what are we committing murder with? Our hearts. But is there ever really good anger? Stop to think, yeah, there's good anger. Just like there's good trouble, <laughs> right? John Lewis talks about that. There is good anger. Anger that finds injustice unacceptable, which of course finds its roots in the fact that we serve and are created in the image of a just God. We know that there were occasions when Jesus himself got angry, right? For example, we're probably familiar with this account. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all uh, who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. And in his anger, it was without exception. It was justified. It was rooted in righteousness. That's what Jesus calls us to. We must see this particular threat as a serious, serious threat to authentic living and authentic community according to the upside down kingdom values. Now, one last thing I don't want us to miss, and I think we often do. If we are worshiping and recall that we have an issue with someone else that remains unresolved, where maybe we're uh, perhaps feeding a grudge, negative feelings, thoughts about that person or persons. That's pretty clear here that worship of God, get this, worship of God is not nearly as important as getting whatever may be wrong, but wrong between you and someone else right. That's amazing. God said, set that aside for us. God said, worship of me, set that aside for a moment. You got something wrong going on between you and a, you, you need to go get that fixed. There seems to be an indication that damage to our relationship with each other can in fact hinder or block our relationship with God. Wow. Love God, <laughs> but you got to love people, <laughs> right? That just keeps coming up over and over again. It's almost as if even before he was asked about the greatest commandment, a little bit later, <laughs> Jesus is beginning to kind of lay the groundwork very early on in his public ministry, so that no one who's been listening is really surprised. Hmm. So, Jesus makes it clear that murder is much more than a physical act. It actually begins with what's going on in our hearts. Jesus continues, and he addresses a second ever-present threat to community. And here's that second threat. The second threat is adultery. Again, let's read from Matthew's Gospel. You've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. What's happening in your mind 
What's happening in my mind? So with that in mind, <laughs> let's get to the bottom line here. Jesus is well aware of what the Pharisees, the religious leaders of his day, thought about this particular issue. While the religious leaders of his day agreed with the premise of this Old Testament law, they did not internalize the law as Jesus is calling for us to do here. In the language of his day, in Greek of his day, the, word, uh, the wording of this commandment regarding coveting your neighbor's wife is the same word that's used for, Jesus used the word lust. It's the same word as covet. And this is the deal here. If you do not break the letter of the other commandments, such as this one, but you want to do so in your heart, you're still guilty. So you don't actually do it, but it's in your heart, it's in your head, and it's taking up residence, paying rent. That's a problem. That's a problem. So let me make a moment, and I want to back up here because I think this is really important. Because much like in the first century world, Jesus, we, we too deal with false narratives around the issue of sexual desire and behavior. It's not a stretch at all to say we live in a culture that is literally saturated, actually obsessed with issues around sex and sexual behavior. As one writer has written, about this. We are fascinated with sexuality. People live for sex, kill for sex. Folks, people die for sex. Thus, we all deal with no small amount of negative baggage around the issue of sex in our day and age. So the question in this moment with regard to what Jesus is telling kingdom people is what do we do? Where do we begin? Exactly how does the upside down kingdom citizen live life with regard to this issue? Well, I believe there's two extremes that Jesus is calling us to avoid in dealing with the issue of adultery, okay? There's other sexual sins included in that, things like lust. So here's one of them. The first is we can't fall for the false narrative that all sexual desire is evil. Okay, that's, that's, that's not true, okay? It's not, not. The truth be known, it can be a really dominant false narrative, especially for those of us who are part of the church. And most of us would probably agree that the main way that this uh, sexual desire is evil thing has been perpetrated in the church is kind of through our own self-imposed, don't ask, don't tell, don't talk about sex. We're not going to do that in the church. Often it has harmful and hurtful consequences. Yes, there was a time when I was much younger, much better looking. You know, when I first began youth ministry, one of the very first retreats I led was a retreat dealing with a number of issues, including sex. Ruthie and I were newly married, and it seemed wise to talk with our students about a very real life issue. I was very intentional to inform our lead pastor ahead of time, along with the parents of the students, that this was the plan. But a few days before the retreat was to take place, I had one set of parents challenge me, and they shared their concerns that any topics dealing with sexuality were inappropriate. This was a topic that should not be talked about with students who were as young as 12, 13, 14. I listened to their concerns, but I held firm to the plan for my retreat. My lead pastor, you know, Alan did a great job. He asked me really hard questions, um, which I was grateful for, but he also backed my decision. Subsequently, the parents who had confronted me, they, they didn't allow their junior high uh, student to participate. And it was only a few years later that the same student, sweet young lady, found herself pregnant and forced to make very difficult decisions way too early. Second, in terms of false narratives that we believe. Here's a one, here's a second one. That all sexual desire is good, yeah. Now, just to be clear, <laughs> 
What Jesus is talking about here is not about noticing a person's beauty, attractiveness, but rather it's an unhealthy and unreasonable obsessing on it, seeking to possess it. The fact is, in our culture, we really leaned into that, and we imbibed this ideal, particularly in the 60s, right? As young people espoused free love, and of course, there's Hugh Hefner and the whole playboy philosophy, which is all about sex being a natural act. We have very few restrictions on sex in our culture. And things that should shock us, they barely register. In a very deep and real sense, we are incredibly desensitized to these things that have the power to wreck us both internally and externally. That's why the call from Jesus here is so powerful for upside down citizens. We're called to live in a different place in light of these realities. We have to reject the temptation to lust and instead love and value and serve others and actively seek what is good for one another. Jesus is speaking of plucking out an eye. Did you read that in the passage? Did you catch that? He's talking about pluck out your eye, uh, uh, cut off a hand. He's trying to help us understand how critically important it is to get what's happening in our minds under control. Jesus instructs those of us who would identify as kingdom citizens regarding the threat of murder, what's going on in our hearts. Secondly, the threat of adultery, what's going on in our minds. And finally, this morning, here's a third deadly threat, a disruptive action that Jesus talks about. Divorce. Talks about divorce. Pick it up with me in verse 31. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Here, I believe Jesus is turning our attention to a specific action. Jesus is talking about what are our hands doing? How are, we, how are we living this out on a daily basis? It's commonly understood in, in the day that Jesus lived in, the issue of adultery was almost exclusively confined to women. In other words, men, including married men, were permitted to have sex with other women, slaves, prostitutes, whereas women were permitted only to have sex with their husbands. And if a woman was found to have committed adultery, She could be abandoned and or executed. You all remember the story in the Gospels about the woman who was caught in adultery. Wait a minute. (laughs) The the title of the story, the woman caught in adultery. But she wasn't by herself. We don't read the story about the woman and the man caught in adultery, do we? No, just the woman. Just the woman. But anyway, please know, I want you to hear me loud and clear on this. In this passage, it's clear that in Jesus' day, there's legal provision for divorce. It it, it exists. Divorce is technically permitted. It was always, always, though, to the disadvantage of women when they were divorced by their husbands because of complete economic dependency on their husbands. And Jesus knew that. Jesus knew that. He could see it all around him. And thus, What Jesus does later on in Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 9, he elaborates. He says, while divorce is not God's intention, it is a way to make space for incredibly hard-heartedness. And I really appreciate, again, what Craig Keener writes about this in his commentary on the Gospel of Matthew. He said this, when Jesus gives explicit divorce as an explicit example of marital infidelity, his principle of challenging all unfaithfulness to one's marriage as adulterous. It forces his followers to examine their own marriages more clearly. A man may never divorce his wife, yet also fail to show her love. A woman may never, uh, she may avoid affairs, yet she despises her husband. These two are acts of unfaithfulness in marriage. Though they're not biblical to grounds for divorce, 
If I am to love my neighbor as myself, how much more should I love my wife as my own body to sacrifice myself for her willingly as Christ offered himself for the truth? And here's the truth. Here's the truth. Time permits me only to scratch the surface here of what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 5, and I apologize for that. But I have this particular point a bit more brief than I wanted to. And there's so much more rich, life-transforming truths to be uncovered here. So this, as I wrap this message up today, I believe it's, it's really easy to get confused by what Jesus is calling his people to, calling us all to in these verses that warn of this triple threat to community. It's a, more than a call to behavior modification. That's not what it is, okay? So hear me loud and clear. It's not just doing the right things. That's part of it, but that's not where Jesus stops because that's never gonna be enough. It's never going to be enough. We'll always get tripped up on being trapped and trying to do the right things, do the right things. There's something else Jesus is pushing for. One of my favorite movies is the 2010 movie. It's called Inception. I don't know if you, have you ever heard of the movie Inception. It's like a James Bond almost movie. It's a thriller in which there's this group of people who enter other people's dreams. And if you know anything about the movie, they enter the dream of the dreamer. And then they can enter the dream that the dreamer is having someone else's dream that they're interacting. Yeah, it's confusing. It's confusing. But they do it in order to plant ideas in people's minds. And in an early scene of the movie, one of the characters, his name is Arthur, he explains to another character named Saito that actually... It isn't difficult to plan ideas in other people's minds. So here's some of the dialogue. Saito says this. Saito says, if you can steal an idea from someone's mind, why can't you plant one there instead? Arthur says this. Okay. Here's me planting an idea in your head. I say to you, don't think about elephants. Elephants. What are you guys thinking about? Right? It's just that simple. It's just that simple. The, this concept explains why so many rigorous self-improvement strategies struggle to yield lasting results. Diets constantly remind dieters what they're missing out on. Every time a former smoker puts on a nicotine patch, they're reminded of what could be in their hands. These things can be great aids to cutting out unhealthy things, but the triple threat to community, as Jesus explains here, it's something in this upside down kingdom living we have to learn how to deal with. It involves learning to be intentional, critically mindful of our inward impulses and external disruptions as it relates to our hearts, motives, as it relates to our heads, what's going on in our minds, in our hands, how we live, our actions. Pray with me, would you? Lord, we are so grateful for these incredibly challenging and strengthening words of warning and encouragement. God, you know <laughs> that we live, and Lord, we have lived in the times where these threats, now Lord, maybe they rise and they fall, but they're, they're constant to us. And as your people who are seeking to be kingdom people, Lord, may we, ever, may we be ever mindful of, of what you are calling us to, what you are inviting us to, Lord, what you are equipping us for. <laughs> so we seek to be kingdom people. We love you. We are so grateful uh, that you, um, Lord, you see around the corners that we can't see. And Lord, you know our future. Uh, Lord, you are guiding and directing us to the places to be the people that you want us to be.
We love you and we thank you. We pray this in the name of your Son, our Savior Jesus. Amen.